Before there was a Linden Avenue or the 101 freeway, before there were markets or houses, even before there were any ranches or farms, there was a thriving boat building community in the Carpinteria Valley. It was called Mishapshino, a Chumash village of Native Americans situated on Carpinteria Creek where it meets the ocean. During the 17 and 1800s, Latin Americans headed north and European settlers moved west, and Carpinteria became a prosperous farming community thanks to the unusually fertile soil and plentiful water from the local creeks and artesian wells. Over time, the Carpinteria Valley has become what it is today, a thriving small town community with a strong agricultural presence and a growing tourism industry. But the impact of humanity has begun to take its toll on Carpinteria's natural resources. The combination of residential, urban, agricultural and recreational uses in the Carpinteria Valley has contributed to a growing water pollution problem. Last year, Carpinteria's beaches had health advisories on 11 days due to elevated bacteria levels, in great part caused by pollutants carried downstream to the ocean through local creeks and waterways. Increased respiratory and ear infections were reported among the surfers at Rincon Point. Increased levels of fecal coliform and pollutants indicative of automobile and farming residue have been found at the mouths of creeks which feed into the ocean. The city of Carpinteria and the county of Santa Barbara have recognized the severity of the situation and are now taking actions toward resolving the problem. Because the problems come from a variety of sources and require a variety of solutions, Everybody in the Carpinteria Valley needs to be involved. In this video, you'll learn about our habits in the past in order to redirect ourselves in the present and into the future. Since prehistoric times when the Chumash lived here, the creeks played a key role in the life of the community. The Chumash could not survive without the creek. And the creek um, was the life blood of the community. Um, the creek was used as a source for water. Um, it contained food in the farm fish and lots of plants, medicinal. And not only that, but the creek also provides rocks and to make tools with, um, grinding stones, uh, mortars and pestles. This is part of, a, of, of a, um, a grinding stone. It's fragmented off, as you can see. But that came from the creek. Chumash baskets, which are world-renowned for their exquisite beauty and, and craftsmanship, were almost exclusively woven of juncus, which is a small bulrush or tule type of a reed that grows along uh, marshes, seeps, springs, and, and creekside settings. Um, and the baskets, the Chumash didn't have pottery. And so their baskets were uh, up with their stone grinding bowls were probably the most uh, utilitarian of their vessels. And here's a little small starter basket that's made out of juncus. Outside of them were coated with asphaltum to make them watertight. And you could carry water from the creeks to the surrounding areas, like to go up into the mountains or surrounding villages. They never took anything that they didn't need. And they didn't leave anything. They were very respectful. So they would never take something from the environment without giving something back. The first foreigners to settle in the area were the Spaniards, who came in the 1700s and established the mission system. In the 1800s, other American and European settlers arrived, and along with the Spanish and Mexicans, they built ranches along the creeks. But unlike the Native Americans, they didn't have the same respect for the waterways. Unfortunately, creeks were used as dumping grounds. The old back fence theory, things are just dumped over your back fence or the, the south 40 into the creek in hopes that the next rains would wash it away. Um, I've heard stories of, you know, when the horse died, it was thrown into the creek. And dumping the waste into the creek is certainly going to have effect on your downstream neighbors. Um, it would certainly have effect eventually, uh, and particularly in Carpinteria, on the ocean environment, since the creek drains so quickly and readily right from the hills to the, to the ocean. A lot of battles have been fought over downstream neighbors, uh, you know, having problem with what their upstream neighbors were dumping into the creek, uh, which later became these neighbors drinking water and or wash water. Uh, they used to say the solution to pollution is dilution, and maybe a hundred years ago that would kind of work, but certainly it can't now with the great numbers of people living along the creeks. 
creeks change with the seasons. In summer, they may have just a trickle of water. But during the rainy months, creeks are essential waterways that carry storm water from the hills and mountains and funnel it into the ocean. Historically, some storms stand out more than others. There's been tremendous storms. The most notable was probably the flood of 1914, um, in which Santa Monica Creek, uh, probably through natural uh, trees and boulders and such, had a, a dam formed high up in the mountains, held back water up to what some say uh, was witnessed as a 40-foot level, and then when the natural dam burst, the uh, water came rushing down. It had rained for about 20 days straight and it flooded all of Old Town, all of the Carpentry Town site under at least five feet of water. It took out um, many, many homes along the creek. It damaged hundreds more. In 1969, there was another tremendous flood which destroyed the freeway overpass above Carpenteria Creek and resulted in damage to homes along Santa Monica and Franklin Creeks. By the early 1970s, the, the citizens of Carpenteria were, uh, were tired of the historical flooding problems that they that they uh, have received and the city and the county then pursued the federal government to make improvements concrete channels and debris basins to improve the flood control system to eliminate that that problem uh, and as a result of the channels that were put in in the 1970s uh, the carpentry area didn't suffer from flooding in the 1990s like many other areas of the south coast did namely in 1995 and 1998 it was determined that really for safety because now there was a much greater population living along the banks of the creek that it should be channelized. Of course that uh, takes away all ability for the creek to recharge the aquifers, the groundwater basin. Um, it of course requires cutting down all the trees, lining it with concrete, um, keeping the flow, the bottom clear. The problem of course is that it absolutely destroys any natural environment of the creek. Um, so with not only the loss of wildlife and the loss of, of uh, beauty but also the loss of the creek's ability to recharge the groundwater. The projects that we see today were built for a single purpose. They were built to eliminate the flooding problems that had hit Carpinteria for many years prior to that. If we were to redo it today, we probably wouldn't have a project like what we see behind us right now. We would probably have a project that balances all those other needs and, and considers not only the flooding impacts but also the other environmental issues which are important today. Today, the Carpinteria Valley is made up of residential housing, open field and greenhouse agriculture, retail and light industry. And the combination of these new influences carry the baggage of old habits that are polluting our environment. The problem has to be tackled on many fronts, since the pollution comes from a variety of sources. Some of the sources of stormwater pollution include our street system, and really anywhere water travels. When it rains and water flows down the gutter, it picks up oil residue and tire residue. When water flows across your front lawns, it'll pick up fertilizers and pesticides. These pollutants are collected in our storm drain system and eventually get in our creeks, like from this culvert here. Once in the creek, they flow downstream and they're deposited on our beaches. There's a real pollution crisis that a lot of people are aware about. A lot of it is from a bacterial contamination runoff from human and animal waste and from farms and so forth in urban areas and this bacteria is a threat to wildlife to some extent but it's really more a threat to human health. People who want to play in the creeks or where the creeks flow out into the ocean. There are other issues with runoff of nutrients from landscaped areas, runoff of oil and grease and so forth from our streets. Uh, it's all, it all adds up all these non-point source pollutants coming from all over the landscape, all over the watershed they're all focused down through runoff into our creeks, so our creeks become a sink for these pollutants. Not to point fingers, but homeless encampments have a great impact upon the creek because an encampment that's, that's well established and usually may, may have uh, quite a few people uh, living there um, doesn't have the proper waste facilities for sewage. All the effluent from day-to-day -day human living and existence goes right into the creek. Some of the high-tech measures to control pollution include special filters in storm drains and catch basins. However, one of the best pollution filters is very low-tech, plants. Most of the places where you have high bacteria counts are where you don't have enough vegetation 
in the in the lagoons or the stream channel. A good example is in Carpinteria because where the streams go through Carp Marsh, which is a functional wetland, still a healthy wetland, that beach over there by Carp Marsh is not polluted. It, it's never had high bacteria count. Where Carp Creek dumps into the ocean, it's a lagoon that isn't vegetated and becomes a festering place where bacteria actually multiply instead of being filtered out. Part of the problem you have is that you have unvegetated lagoons, there's no vegetation, with a lot of bottom muds, and all those toxics, including the bacteria, sink down into the bottom muds and stay there, and then every time there's a storm and the waves come in and kind of stir up those bottom muds, you get huge uh, pollutant counts. What happens in a natural channel if you have enough vegetation, as the water goes up into the plants, it cleans out the pollutants out of the water. The vegetation along some of our creeks has been altered by surrounding development, and it's been removed altogether from the concrete channels of Franklin and Santa Monica creeks. Some communities are attempting to remove portions of concrete channels and restore native habitats. Fortunately, Carpinteria Creek has remained relatively natural, and it's really a, a treasure uh, for this community. Um, other communities have embraced their creeks and done fairly well with it. Uh, Royal Grande is one example in San Luis Obispo, where the downtown is enhanced by a somewhat natural creek running right through the business district of town. I doubt with the development along Santa Monica Creek, I don't know that that's a possibility. With Carpinteria Creek, what's, what's wonderful about that is it remains unchannelized now, um, and, and certainly one of the largest creeks on the south coast. Rincon Creek is, is much the same way. Carpenterians pass over the creeks every day by car, bike, and foot. Most of us are not aware of the creeks or their importance, but they have a great value to both people and wildlife. There are more birds found, have been more birds found over the last 20 or 30 years in this creek within the city limits than are found in any other creek or in any other spot along the entire Pacific Coast between San Luis Obispo or Pismo Beach and Huntington Beach in Orange County. Migration along the Pacific Coast largely runs from Northern California to Mexico but could from, come from the Arctic to South America these birds are hungry when they move. They move very far at night. There is a very great need then that these birds feel for a rest area that has water running year round, provides food, insects and seeds, and seclusion. The creeks in this area, Carpinteria, are so valuable for so many reasons. Uh, from a biological standpoint, an ecological standpoint, they provide habitat for over half of the wildlife species in this area. In this pool right here, I've seen fish, fish this size that were the same color as the water. On the bank down here, maybe two football fields away, I saw baby mountain lions, two of them this high, pointy little striped ears. There's a blue heron, a great blue heron that comes to fish here and that has been coming here for three or four years, four or five years. On that bank, loping through the trees, I've seen a coyote. Historically and currently, as you see, many of the farmlands are along creeks where they have rich floodplains. Uh, creeks are valuable aesthetically for people to go and enjoy the beauty of a creek, the sounds of creeks. Uh, they, creeks bring peace and solitude to people. They convey flood water safely to the ocean. Um, our creeks also offer recreational values. But after the rains, and they fill with water, and they are the most wonderful playground. Everybody, every child should have the opportunity to play in a creek, and every adult should find the child within to get down there and play too. In terms of water pollution, creeks are very valuable because the, the plants that grow in stream beds, they actually filter out a lot of the pollutants that run off of urban and agricultural landscapes. You can see willows sprouting up all along the bank. You can tell the willows by the little catkins, the pussy willows that grow. 
These are sycamores, beautiful sycamores. Note their mottled white bark and the lovely new spring leaves. Those are blackberries, the famous Gubernador Canyon blackberries. And here is a little baby California live oak. This is mugwort, sometimes called Magellan's wart, and it's a cure for poison oak. And here's horsetail, one of the oldest plants on earth. I think it was around when the dinosaurs were. It's a terrific source of silica, very good for your hair and your nails. People drink a tea made of horsetail. This is watercress. And if we knew that the water were pure, that there were no toxins or pollutants in it, we could make lovely watercress sandwiches or put some in our salad. One of the obvious values of creeks is that they're home to fish and a recreational spot for fishermen. Unfortunately, the steelhead trout that are native to this area are an endangered species. From Chumash times up to just a few decades ago, steelhead were plentiful. But now they are an endangered species and illegal to fish. Young spawn fish fry are, are, are extremely sensitive um, to any sort of pollutants, including from the early development in the egg. For steelhead to be restored and for them to survive a restoration project means that there must be cool water. And wherever the trees are absent from the banks, wherever the landowners or the Army Corps of Engineers has cut down these trees or lo lost the trees, there is so much sunlight that it's too warm for steelhead to survive. And when you concrete channelize a creek, there aren't any steelhead in those creeks. They can't swim through the concrete channel because there are no pools and riffles. 99% of the steelhead population in Southern California has been wiped out. So the fact that Carpinteria still has a few steelhead in its creeks is really wonderful news. And hopefully, now that grants are being made available to restore creeks, we can have more steelhead come back to our streams and then we can get them delisted or taken off the endangered species list uh, once we get them to be more plentiful. What's being done to help our creeks? The city of Carpinteria, Santa Barbara County, and a variety of groups and individuals are working together to take responsible steps towards permanently resolving the problems. The South Coast Watershed Characterization Study provides water sampling and source identification for Carpinteria and Rincon Creeks. The city has taken a proactive approach to its storm drain and runoff management program. Currently, the Public Works Department is creating a new comprehensive map of the storm drain network in order to help locate and eliminate illegal discharges that end up in our creeks. Street sweeping, performed on a monthly basis throughout the city, removes thousands of tons of pollutants annually before they enter the creeks. For the long range, the city has received a grant to do a creek preservation program um, throughout the city, focusing on Carpinteria Creek to establish development standards and setback criteria to assure that the creek is protected and that its natural biofilters remain in place. Another proactive measure is being taken by the Carpinteria Sanitary District in conjunction with homeowners at Rincon Point. The district is in the process of designing a sewer system for the area, which will result in the abandonment of the septic tanks and connection to the district system. We expect this project to be finished in the middle of the year 2002. Another city measure to help clean the environment occurs each spring, when the city of Carpinteria sponsors a household hazardous waste collection day. Valley residents and small business owners are invited to bring waste products such as old cleansers, pool chemicals, aerosol cans, and pesticides to City Hall to be properly handled and disposed of at no cost. The collection event is one of the most effective methods for keeping hazardous waste from being illegally or improperly discarded in and around Carpinteria. It's run in conjunction with a city-sponsored spring cleaning day, so residents can bring their excess trash and recycling as well as old chemical waste. This year, over 20,000 pounds of hazardous waste was safely accepted at the HHW event. Last year, the city of Carpinteria opened a weekend ABOP at City Hall. The ABOP facility is designed to help Carpinteria residents and small businesses to legally and safely dispose of recyclable hazardous waste. The facility accepts used antifreeze, household and car batteries, motor oil and filters, and latex paint for recycling or exchange.
This is a free service to the community, and it's open every Saturday from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And one of the backbones of the city's recycling effort is the used oil facility next to City Hall. It's open every Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 3.30 p.m., and it's also open during ABOP hours on Saturday from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. It's an easy-to-use self-serve facility and safely recycles one of the worst polluters in the valley, used motor oil. There are many ways to fight pollution, and to win the battle we need to take advantage of every resource available. Wanda Mikolenko and her Carpinteria neighbors use a low-tech method in their neighborhood. The neighbors just didn't want the traditional uh, curbing and gutters and all that. The runoff here on Olive Street and um, Willow and this neighborhood flows into the yard. So then it soaks into the ground and it's eventually going to get down to the water table but going through the earth is going to clean out the pollutants. So we park our cars on the lawn or on a driveway that drains onto the lawn. So all the oil that drips off the cars is not going into a storm drain down into the, street, uh, into the creek. It's also pleasant. Instead of all this cement for streets and sidewalks, we, we've got grass and flowers. Gravel driveways and driveways that use interlocking bricks also take advantage of the earth as a biofilter. Hopefully, you now have a better grasp of the important role creeks play in our everyday lives. Here are some closing thoughts from local Carpenterians. I think our biggest challenge will be to get people to understand that we're all part of the problem and that we all need to be part of the solution. If we could actually reestablish a run of steelhead, uh, I think that that would bode well for the entire health and life of the creek. In my heart, I know that a creek is a beautiful thing. Listen to the sound right now. That's life. Thank you.